Welcome, everyone. My name is Richard Albert. I'm Professor of World Constitutions and Director of Constitutional Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. The Constitutional Studies Program, which I direct, is one of the co-sponsors and co-organizers for this conference. And it's for us just a great gift to partner with the organizing committee to bring you this landmark conference. This year, I'm the Alan Rock Visiting Professor of Law at the University of Ottawa, which is located in my hometown. So it's good to be home this year. But today, I'm standing on the campus of the University of Texas at Austin, which is located on the indigenous lands of the Tonkawa. Their careful stewardship of these grounds has made it possible for me and so many others to live a joyful life of learning. And so I honor the Tonkawa, and I ask you to join me in doing the same. Today, I have to admit that I feel like a kid in a candy store because I have the great joy of moderating a discussion between two giants in Canadian constitutional law, two scholars whose contributions have shaped our knowledge of the Canadian constitution. And I have to say more personally, two scholars whose work attracted me to the field of constitutional studies. They have truly modeled for me and for so many others what makes good scholarship. Let me refer you to their full bios on the conference website, but for now, just a short word on each. Professor Jamie Cameron is a distinguished scholar of constitutional law at Osgoode Hall Law School, a member of the Ontario Review Board, and served as director and vice president of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association for 20 years. And Justice Patrick Monaghan is currently a judge on the Ontario Superior Court and formerly served as Deputy Attorney General for the Government of Ontario, and also as Dean of Osgoode Law School. You should know, and I will tell you, that these two were our very first choices for this conversation on the impacts of the Meech Lake and Charlottetown Accords. And so we're also very grateful that they both accepted. So Professor Cameron, Jamie, Justice Monaghan, Patrick, thank you for being here. And thanks to all of you, our attendees, for joining us today. Before we dive into our conversation, just one last word. Let me just extend an invitation to all of our attendees. Please send us your questions. If you have a thought or a comment or a question, just type it into the chat box. And somehow it's going to magically make its way to me. And I'll try to convey the question, comment to our speakers. And so with that, let's get started on this conversation, a conversation on the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, two failed efforts at constitutional reform in Canada, two failed efforts that haunt us still today. So Professor Cameron, Jamie, Justice Monahan, Patrick, the Meech Lake and Charlottetown Accords were rejected some 30 years ago. And at the time, the failures were quite dramatic. Today, looking back, do Meech Lake and Charlottetown still matter for our modern constitutional politics in your view? Jamie, do you want to go ahead? Sure, uh, I can go first. And I think I'll um, stick to uh, basically just a couple of brief impressions. So I, I think that the failure of these two accords uh, does matter in a negative sense, uh, because I think to some extent, the rather dramatic failure of these both these accords did institutionalize the failure of constitutional reform at a broader level. It obviously, both of them left unfinished business on the table. And I think they all, the failures also undermined our faith and trust in our political leadership. And I suppose another point is that we, we lost, with the failure of these accords, we lost the momentum and maybe even the belief in constitutional reform. But uh, I'd also like to switch it up and say, you know, maybe there are some positive um, some some, posi some pos positives to note. I mean, I think that probably uh, we learned some hard lessons uh, during this process of constitutional reform. Uh, we placed an impossible, a near impossible burden on the constitutional text and the process of reform. You know, treating it as a kind of an elixir or a fix all for um, longstanding problems, and as uh, anyone who's read Richard's work knows, uh, and also they know from their own 
uh, expertise, there's no such thing as a perfect constitutional text. And a political and legal system of constitutionalism must adapt to the imperfections of text. So I think that since 1982, and since the failure of these two accords, we have been learning to live with the constitution we have. And um, perhaps we uh, realize or accept that our legendary pragmatism as Canadians um, um, serves us well, you know, I, I suppose as a second best failing constitutional reform, but nonetheless serves us well. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to what Patrick has to say. Well, thank you. And let me just pick up, first of all, Richard, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to participate in this conference. I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to the opportunity. Just picking up on what Jamie uh, said, <clears throat> I guess I would frame it in, in these terms and really uh, distinguish between what we might call formal constitutional amendment, that's amendment to the text of the constitution itself, as opposed to informal constitutional change, which is an ongoing process that continues uh, uh, below that level of formal constitutional change. I think what, <clears throat> what the failure of Meech and Charlottetown demonstrated, uh, and we can talk a bit more about this, is that it's, it's really not possible to enact any significant formal amendment changes to our constitution. By that I mean amendments that would require either the 750 formula or the unanimity formula in the constitution. The only formal amendments we can make really are <clears throat> the amendments that are one of the unilateral procedures, i.e. unilateral provincial, unilateral federal, or the bilateral between the federal and, and provincial. Now, <clears throat> That's significant because there are aspirations, there are aspirations for different parts of the country for formal constitutional change, including indigenous peoples, including the province of Quebec, including the Western provinces. But what was clear after 1992 is that there's really no way to pursue those options through amendments to the formal text of the Constitution. The only way to pursue those options is through a process of incremental and formal change. And we've seen that those changes have in fact been emerging in that incremental way. And we can talk a bit more about that. I mean, in terms of indigenous rights, for example, that has come to a large extent through political change and through the courts uh, pushing uh, political change and, 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 and interpreting the existing constitutional provisions in a, in a in a robust way and we've seen the province of quebec uh, developing its own uh, identity and in fact affirming that identity and we've seen some changes in the way in which senators are effectively uh, going to be uh, appointed. and so we continue to have that constitutional change but we we've we've seen that it's really not possible i think and i think we can talk a bit more about this it's really not possible to enact formal constitutional change because of the lessons that we've learned and the failures that we, that we encountered in both in both Meech and Charlottetown. Richard, could I just of say course. something, if that's okay? Um, I guess um, I don't entirely agree that there's no way to pursue formal change. And so I would just add one comment, which is that one of the consequences of the failure of Meech and Charlottetown is that the process of constitutional amendment became yet more complicated. So rather than um, follow the rules that are set out in Part 5 um, of the 1982 Constitution, uh, what we did in Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, and then after both of those accords, was to keep piling on additional requirements to the process of change. So these requirements, I'm not going to go through a list of them or anything, but these requirements are statutory in nature, uh, both at the federal and provincial levels. Uh, they're also jurisprudential in nature. And then there's some that could be considered conventional in nature, the, the uh, question of whether um, legitimate constitutional change requires a referendum process. So I think that there's uh, there's two problems with this. One is that uh, the process of change itself in legal, uh, it, purely from a legal perspective, becomes 
much more complicated than it is just under the terms of part five. But it, in, in the complicating of the process, the question of what is required has become really quite blurred. So that it's very difficult to say at this point in time exactly what is required from a legal and constitutional point of view for amendment to be successfully uh, proposed and uh, brought through to uh, brought through to uh, fruition. So um, I guess um, um, why I say I haven't completely given up is that I actually don't think that the Part Five amending formulas are all that bad, and I wonder whether we might have a better chance of thinking about constitutional reform if we were to find a way to walk some of those uh, post-Charlottetown restrictions back and trust the Part 5 amending formula. Now, there's still a bunch of other things in our amendment culture that pose obstacles, but uh, one of the things that has always um, seemed kind of a paradox to me is that we went to this huge uh, it, it, it was such a struggle for us to reach the point of patriating the Constitution and entrenching amendment rules, and then we were unable to trust them enough to follow them, and we've added all these other requirements, I think because of a fear of failure, but because, because we've added so many, we uh, make it impossible even to try. So uh, that's sort of the way I see it post-Charlottetown. Well, let's pick up on this point. Um, modern Canadian constitutional reform has been a sequence of actions and reactions, and some have been expected and some have not. So beginning with patriation, that gives us a homegrown constitution that we didn't get at Confederation. Then the Meech Lake Accord is an effort to kiss and make up with Quebec after patriation. Then we get the hyper-inclusive Charlottetown Accord, which is a response to the hyper-exclusive process that led to the Meech Lake Accord. And so picking up on your point just now, Jamie, has the failure of the Charlottetown Accord had consequences for how we've pursued constitutional reform in Canada since 1992? Justice Monaghan has, has gestured toward this, as have you. You've begun to list the categories in which Part 5 has been changed uh, by statute at the national level, at the provincial level also the territorial level, by convention perhaps, and also by judicial opinion. But how has this increasing difficulty of constitutional amendment, formal amendment, how has that led to the kinds of changes that have been made to the Canadian Federation since then? Because we haven't remained static since then, correct? Right? We've changed, we've evolved. So how has the impact of the failure of meat and Charlottetown led us to innovate new ways of reforming the Canadian Constitution. Jamie, do you want to go ahead? Well, um, not really. I don't see all of them as particularly positive. I mean, I think the laying on of statutory uh, requirements uh, has not uh, been a positive feature of how we've imagined constitutional reform in the post-Charlottetown period, and I've already said that. Um, and the other kinds of workarounds that we have been able to use in the time since Charlottetown, and I won't list them out because I don't remember them all, um, uh, they have been uh, beneficial in allowing us to move forward, as Patrick has said, in an incremental way to achieve, um, to achieve uh, important objectives, uh, but in a scaled back, more modest way. And there's um, a, lot, a, a lot to be said for that. But I think that um, when um, uh, informal change uh, becomes the go-to and we've given up on formal change, uh, we, we do lose certain things. I mean, one of the things that can be forgotten about the entire period from 1982 to Charlottetown and, and after Charlottetown is that it was a period of uh, very intense, very, very intense civic engagement. Um, and, and that um, resulted in the failure of both the Accords, but it was, a, it was a 
positive uh, feature. It was a positive element in the evolution of our system of democratic constitutionalism. And so um, when change is restricted to informal mechanisms, um, what is lost is that opportunity for engagement and even for, I don't know, constitution building, uh, um, uh, um, um, an opportunity for members of the democratic community to um, be affiliated with the constitution and to share in the project of constitutional reform, even, even um, just in the sense of being the beneficiaries of it. And I sort of think back to the charter as an example. So the charter was, um, I believe, when it was first put forward, it was presented as the people's charter. And, you know, not it's clear that not everyone was in favor of the charter, um, but the charter was like an important element of uh, an important element of of um, positive reinforcement for the democratic community in the whole process of constitutional reform. I don't see anything like a charter uh, charter project uh, coming forward in in the next years. But what I'm saying is that we we're limited to informal uh, change, and that's a, a good thing because it allows us to get things done. But something is lost when we are unable to imagine how we might ever uh, how we might ever mount a process of constitutional reform that is inclusive and participatory. Justice Monaghan, you may have a different view on this. Um, you know, much of the action post Charlottetown. Um, has been off the books, which is to say, as Professor Cameron Jamie mentioned, informally, right, in ways that aren't reflected in the constitutional text. And so the question for you is whether we as Canadians, as a constitutional polity, whether we lose something as a result when constitutional change occurs in these informal ways and when we can't gather in the ways that Jamie was describing, people coming together in these moments of civic engagement to discuss altering the foundational constitutional acts that, conform, that uh, comprise the Constitution of Canada? Do we lose anything when the Constitution changes only informally? I think we do. I mean, I agree with Jamie. I think we do. First of all, we do uh, lose the fact that uh, we can't do directly what we might want to do. Instead, we have to find workarounds. So, uh, for example, uh, in 1992, uh, one of the things that Charlottetown would have entrenched was an inherent right to Indigenous or Aboriginal self-government. Uh, that requires the, 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 the introduction of an inherent right in the text requires a formal amendment. Uh, and so that wasn't possible because it was part of the Charlottetown package. It wasn't, in, it wasn't approved. And so it's been left to the courts and to... Uh, the political process to enhance and build upon uh, Indigenous rights in our Constitution, or, or at least as a practical matter, but knowing that uh, it's not possible to incorporate that in the Constitution itself. And I think we do lose something. We do lose a sense of clarity, and we do lose a sense of of, of trying to define for ourselves in a, in, a, in a clear way in the Constitution what we believe the Constitution stands for, because the Constitution isn't just a text. It's about a set of values. Mm -hmm. It's about a set of fundamental values that we're committed to as a society. So when we can't articulate that in that formal constitution, we, we, we do lose something. That said, I am of the view that uh, it, it is not likely, it is very unlikely that we would ever be able to achieve uh, formal constitutional amendment of significant uh, to dealing with significant issues, including indigenous self-government, Aboriginal self-government or other other matters, um, because both Meech and Charlottetown have told us that either a narrow approach or a broader approach. The narrow approach was the Meech Lake process, trying to focus on a limited agenda or the yeah. Charlottetown process, which was the very broad, inclusive, uh, were unsuccessful. And so as far as formal constitutional amendment goes I, I think there's really uh, two choices that we have we, we stay with the constitution we have uh, which is a, which is a, as a going concern our constitution is a going concern in other words I, I, I mean by that it can still operate it can still function on a day-to-day -day basis we can still make decisions we have elections uh, we, we can uh, governments can enact legislation 
political parties can form, new movements can form, new pressures can for political change can be exerted and 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 be reflected in in, in legislation. But if we want to change the formal text, my view has been that really the only choice would be to try to jump outside of those rules. And by that, I mean what Quebec attempted in 1995 through the referendum, which almost succeeded. Uh, that was an attempt to jump outside. That was an attempt to say, we're going to unilaterally uh, declare that we are, in this case, Quebec is, a, is an independent country. And that will break open that that will require uh, some kind of a change. Now, the point of that, of course, Richard, is only governments can do that. Right? Political actors can't break open the Constitution, can't jump outside the rules. Only governments have the power, I would argue, to do that. Because go and governments still control the Part 5 mechanism because responsible government means that governments control the legislatures and the legislatures have to enact the amendments even under the 750 formula uh whether even without these statutory overlays so my my view would be that yes we do lose something but i think we have to face that that's the reality i think that we are faced with and that has been confirmed over the last 30 years given the failure of, of charlottetown and the subsequent attempt in Quebec to uh, move toward independence, which ultimately was not accepted, uh, which leaves us with our constitution, which, as I say, is a going concern. It still can operate and can function on a day-to-day -day basis. Which brings us to an important theme, I think, one of legitimacy. <coughs> legitimacy. So we have part five, which codifies a rule for how to change the constitution of Canada through legal procedures formally altering the text of the Constitution. And we can say that when we achieve the requisite agreements of governments around Canada to amend the Constitution of Canada, subject to the rules of Part 5, that not only are we doing it legally, but the very fact that we're doing it legally and following those procedures breathes a certain legitimacy to the change, to the amendment. Now, can we say the same thing when the Constitution is changed, when the meaning of the Constitution is changed outside of the four corners of Part 5, let's say, Justice Monaghan, by judicial interpretation. Are we thinking now of a different form of legitimacy? And Jamie, you've written about the relationship between legality and legitimacy in the long horizon of Canadian constitutional law and politics. So it'd be great to hear your views as well, specifically about the relationship, the tension at some points between legality and legitimacy. Um, I think um, what I would say for the moment is that um, because of the dynamics of constitutional reform and political leadership and um, all that was going on, post-patriation, including, of, of course, Quebec's uh, failure to consent, um, the part five uh, turned out not to be legitimate of its own right. Uh, because as we know, uh, the parties departed from compliance with part five in the Meech Lake Accord, making it more difficult for the accord to be ratified and become a part of the constitution and they also departed from part five um, with the Charlottetown Accord. Um, and in, in, again, making it significantly more difficult uh, to satisfy, um, to, to achieve a, a successful result in the Charlottetown Accord. And so, um, and so uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about our history of constitutional amendment is that even now, uh, when we have our own homegrown, homegrown domestic amending formula, we still don't really know what is needed to make constitutional amendment or constitutional reform legitimate in the sense of there's the dog barking, so you let me know if you don't need to mute. But I think that, I'm so sorry, um, I'm going to close the door. Well, it's clear that um, 
And I'm not the only one who's excited about your remarks, Professor Karen. You know, I used to. <laughs> so, so usually, usually uh, the legitimacy of change follows its legality, um, but but that didn't happen in our case. And I think there's, as as you know, Richard, I think there's still a legitimacy gap. And so um, I I wouldn't say that um, um, informal amendments to the constitutional through jurisprudential change and so forth are not legitimate. I would not say that, but um, I, I just to sort of uh, circle back to what Patrick and I were both saying a few minutes ago, um, one of the things that is lost uh, when the opportunity for formal change is no longer uh, is no longer available is that there are certain kinds of constitutional reform that are so uh, pivotal and important that they almost need to be done by a formal process so that they are given the ideological and symbolic importance that they require. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I can't speak for others, but, you know, this is very much part of what was so important about Meech Lake uh, was uh, Quebec had to be brought in in a formal and very visible way. Now there were changes to the constitution being made as well, but there was also that very, very important uh, form, uh, symbolic and ide ideological importance that attached to it. So, um, so uh, I, I think that part of the reason uh, we keep bogging down the legality of constitutional amendment and part of the reason that we are very apprehensive about trying it is that we really don't know exactly what legitimacy means in the context of amending our own constitution. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a very um, intriguing thing to be saying about our own constitution after, uh, what, 150 years now? Hmm. Can I just add to this discussion by saying that the, 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 what I suggest to be the unamendability of the constitution reflects a perhaps more profound issue of legitimacy, which is simply this. Is there, in fact, a consensus on the underlying values of Canada and of the nature of Canada and of what it means to be part of Canada? Because what, what I would suggest is that the true reason why Charlottetown failed now, by the way, any future amendment would have to be approved in a national referendum. There's no doubt about that. It's not part of Part 5, but for legitimacy reasons, it would have to be. But I think the reason, my view, why Meech, why Meech and Charlottetown failed was that there is no actual consensus on what is the nature of the country. There are rather different views, strongly held in different parts of the country and amongst different constituencies. And it is for that reason that Charlottetown was rejected by the people because, mm. because it didn't, in different parts of the country, it tried to give expression to all of these different ideas without attempting to sort of resolve them. And so therefore what ultimately happened was people said, I don't agree with this because of this provision or these provisions, whether it, it goes too far in this direction, it doesn't go far enough in that direction. And so they say, well, how can a country continue to exist 30 years later if there's no consensus on some of these underlying values? And I think the answer is, well, we agreed to disagree, but we'll leave it alone, right? Because we, we, we sense, and there is a sense, I think, that if we had to agree, if we had to sit down and figure out what are these values that underlie Canada, we'd have a great deal of difficulty in achieving that, any type of consensus that would that would pass through the entire part of the country. So in a sense, this unamendability, if you will, is simply the of the formal text is a reflection of this deeper, more profound division that characterizes the country. And indeed, if we had that consensus, if we had that underlying sense of values, then that would provide the foundation, I would argue, a necessary foundation for a broad-based constitutional amendment. So I see it as more than just a technical issue. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of values 
and it exists at a very profound level. And so what we've said is, well, we'll put that away because we don't actually need to deal with that right now. And we'll deal with things that are more immediate and seen as more pressing on the political agenda. But my Richard, if I could just... Of course, I'm just going to add uh, that my colleague Gary Jacobson will call that um, disharmony. Yeah. We have a disharmonic constitution, not unlike many other countries around the world that are comprised of many different peoples with many different histories, many different views and values. Jamie? Yeah, if, if I could just uh, respond a little bit to Patrick. I mean, I just... Listening to you, Patrick, it just felt so bleak. <laughs> so um, we got to tell it like it is, though, right, Jamie? It, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess I'm um, um, less convinced that uh, the fail, and less convinced about the reasons for failure and whether they were a function of the dynamics of the time or whether they represent a sort of an uh, irreparable and systemic. Uh, lack of consensus in our country. Um, but I, uh, it definitely was the case at the time of those two accords. I don't know whether, um, I, I, I don't know whether those same dynamics are present to the same degree at this point in time. I will say about, um, and it's the Charlottetown process in particular, I was um, doing a little bit of background reading and I bumped into a comment that Bob Ray made, and I think it was in the interim between um, the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, and he, he said, uh, we have to understand the importance of making the Constitution our own. This also sort of reflects uh, some of the comments I heard in um, Richard Maley's excellent podcast series that, uh, you know, the, the problem with, I suppose, the Charlottetown Accord in particular was that it was just a patchwork of uh, sort of desperate measures uh, across the sweep of the Constitution to salvage the country. And it didn't really speak to who we are as Canadians and what uh, our constitution is to us. And so again, um, uh, I sort of, ag I, I definitely agree the, with the assessment of those accords, but um, I'm less willing to say that the lack of consensus is as hardwired into our culture as I, as I heard from Patrick. We've now reached about the midpoint in this one hour discussion. Let me remind all attendees, please do send in questions and comments. Just type them into the chat box and then I'll get them and I'll convey them to our guests. So we talked a bit about legitimacy. Let's focus now on legality a little bit more. There's an interesting historical continuity. At Confederation, we did not have the legal authority to amend our constitution on our own. There were a few exceptions, of course, but we didn't have that legal authority generally. Today, we have the legal authority to do it. We just can't manage to do it. And so the question is, what good is having this legal authority to amend our constitution if we can't exercise that power? Here, of course, I'm speaking only of section 38 and section 44 because we can amend the constitution through the unilateral procedures that Justice Monaghan mentioned a moment ago, and of course also the bilateral procedure. But speaking of section 38, the 750 formula, and section 41, the unanimity procedure, what good is having the legal authority to do something if we can't exercise that power? Well, perhaps I might just say that uh, I actually regard it as it's not, it's not just uh, do they serve any function. I actually regard it as a serious deficiency, a serious difficulty that we have these formal amendment procedures. We no longer go to the United Kingdom, thank goodness. We don't need to depend on Boris Johnson or what, you know, whoever formed the government at the time in, uh, in Westminster. And so we have this domestic amending formula controlled by governments ultimately, although requires now popular consensus. But uh, it creates an underlying instability. Mm -hmm. Simply this. If at any point it becomes necessary to amend the formal text of the Constitution, 
at that point, we are going to be confronted with this problem because we have been able for 30 years to work around, to find workarounds, to find ways to incrementally amend our arrangements, not the formal text, but the way in which we operate as a, as a society. If the day comes, and it may, we can't predict now if it may, it, it's certainly, a, but it's certainly a realistic possibility where the Constitution needs to be amended in some formal way. And yet we are faced with not being able to do that. At that point, we are going to be confronted with a very difficult situation indeed. So it's, it's actually a cause not just to say, gee, it would be nice if we could do it. It's actually a cause for concern. It's a worry to have at our center of our constitution this instability. Namely, if we did have to amend the formal constitution, we wouldn't be able to do so. And I think that is actually a serious shortcoming and a serious potential problem for Canadians. Um, I don't disagree, Patrick. You know, a, a constitution should be... Uh perhaps be difficult to amend, but not uh, impossible to amend. Because um, a constitution that is impossible to amend is at least potentially an unstable constitution. And so I agree with that point. I guess um, what I would say on this question that you asked, with, which is what good is the legal authority? Well, from my point of view, the 1982 patriation and the amendment rules were really important because they established our amendment sovereignty. Um, and I, I would never understate the importance of that. And um, maybe it's just me, but I remain scandalized that we're not able to amend our own constitution uh, for most of the history of our country. Uh, and, and not even after we achieved independence in 1931. And I guess um, I would far rather have part fives Five's rules for amendment, then continue this surrogate process of amendment by proxy through the United Kingdom. And I think there's an argument to be made that that's also unstable in certain ways. Um, and uh, in terms of um, a crisis that might come our way that requires the Constitution to be amended, the lack of amendment rules was that crisis. It was just a low-level crisis that went on for uh, decades and decades, it was always going to have to be addressed, in my view, um, maybe not at exactly the time, and maybe not in exactly the way as 1982, but that uh, is a more serious deficiency, in my view, than the deficiencies we have with the rules that are currently in our Constitution. You know, this suggests a larger point, uh, constitutional truth across jurisdictions and history which is that constitutional change is often impelled by constitutional crisis. So perhaps our amendment impasse in Canada will ultimately be broken in that way by a constitutional crisis. And so the question for you two is whether you foresee any impetus for constitutional reform that will be impossible to ignore and impossible to address without a large scale constitutional reform, what might that impetus be? Well, I, I might jump in because I, I do have some thoughts uh, mm -hmm. about this, and it sort of picks up from what Jamie had said just a moment ago, which is that we were unable to amend our own constitution for uh, over 100 years, and we, we dealt with that in 1982. What we didn't deal with, however, is the continuing mm -hmm. connection to the British crown, uh, and Queen Elizabeth is still the Queen formerly of Canada, even though she doesn't exercise any legal powers. Uh, effectively, she exercises legal powers, but she does so on the advice of ultimately the Prime Minister of Canada. The point is that we, again, this is one of these issues that we just decided, all right, we'll just leave that alone. We, Queen Elizabeth has been there. She's been there since the early 1950s. We can live with that. But uh, when I've reflected on this, uh, it seems to me that um, that may change uh, at the point at which Queen Elizabeth uh, ceases to hold the crown and the crown passes to uh, another person, whether 
this, to this point, next in line would be Prince Charles. And at that point, uh, Canadians might say, you know what, we're actually not prepared to keep going with this. We, we need to change this. And, and if that were to happen, then the, the current situation, which is essentially that the prime minister appoints the governor general of Canada uh, without any formal uh, process, without any um, public uh, discussion, simply announces the governor general, which is the current political rule, um, I, I think would would be very difficult to maintain. Would be would, there would need to be some change to that. And how that could happen, uh, could it be done without an amendment to the formal constitution? I think it'd be very difficult to do so because it would be the crown, the position of the crown is, of course, one of the requirements that requires the changes that requires consent in cases over the years that have defined that as not merely the formal change to those powers, but even informal changes to the powers of the governor general or the or and ultimately of, of the queen herself. And so uh, in thinking about what could arise on the horizon sometime in, let's say, in the next not too distant future, something of that order, I think, would bring forward uh, this issue of, well, can we really continue with things as they are? Or do we need to go down this road of formal constitutional change? And once that is opened, I think we are back down this road. And uh, I am of the view it would not <clears throat> ultimately be successful. Uh, but of course, I could be wrong. I may be unduly pessimistic about that. Uh, but uh, I, I think that would expose then these underlying issues of values, which I ultimately say is the grounding of any, would have to be there to form the basis of any comprehensive constitutional change at that time. I would just add that any change to the head of state, I would have to imagine, is a kind of a first order constitutional issue for uh, any, any system of constitutionalism. Um, and and a, uh, a, a significant and a difficult change to make. The only other thing I would say is that I have no hesitation whatsoever, whatsoever in saying that I doubt that there is consensus on this issue um, um, within the population of Canada or even at the levels of government. Um, I mean, I think the other question I was thinking about when you were talking about this, when Patrick, you said it opens up all uh, these other things, I mean, again, the question is, well, could, could it even be dealt with as a discrete issue because it had to be dealt with uh, by force of circumstance? Or would it then uh, lead to this escalation that we saw before when we went from the Meech Lake Accord process, which was styled the Quebec round, through to Charlottetown, which, um, which uh, failed abysmally because it, it tried to do too much and did so ineffectively? Well, if I could just pick up on that, because this is this is where the issue w w will be tested. Because in order to enact amendment to the, the head of state, it requires not merely resolutions of the Senate and House of Commons. It requires resolutions of all 10 provincial legislatures, including the legislature of Quebec. And the position of the government of Quebec and the legislature of Quebec and National Assembly of Quebec for many decades has been that they will not enact formal amendments unless those that package of amendments addresses the historic concerns of Quebec. And we can debate whether we think outside of Quebec sitting wherever we are, those historic concerns are good, bad, indifferent, whatever they might be. But it, uh, it would appear that there's a broad consensus in the in, in Quebec uh, that there would be the necessity to address the historic uh, demands or uh, the historic needs or, of Quebec. And so, is it possible to imagine that the Quebec National Assembly would pass an amendment to deal with the status of the crown without also dealing with these other matters? I think not. It, it may be possible to simply have the Premier of Quebec from time to time say, well, we really do have the need for formal constitutional amendment, but we're prepared to leave that aside for, for now. Uh, 
But if another cause arises or another mm -hmm. issue arises that forces the Quebec National Assembly to enact a resolution amending the Constitution, I doubt, I think it is virtually a certainty that at that point, Quebec would say, well, we need to address these concerns. And then we're down the same road that led us to Meech and then ultimately led us to Charlottetown because then, well, if we're going to deal with Quebec's demands, then we have to deal with these other pressing issues, Indigenous self-government, the rights of Western Canadians, the Senate. And so we're down the same road that we traveled between 1987 mm -hmm. and 1992. And I think the result ultimately would likely be the same. Mm -hmm. We are now at about 14 minutes left in this discussion. I have been enjoying this immensely, but that's because I've been hogging the puck. I'm the only one who has questions. And so to these attendees here in the room, if you have questions or comments, please just input it into the chat box. I will get them and then I'll put them to our two guests. But for now, I'll keep the puck. Happy to pass it off to someone else, but for now, I'll keep it. And I want to come to a more personal type of a question, if I could, Professor Cameron and Justice Monahan, because I'm not sure uh, all of our attendees know, some surely do, that you two had a front row seat for the Meech Lake and Charlottetown Accords. Justice Monaghan, could you reflect perhaps on your involvement in the Meech Lake Accord? And similar question for you, Professor Cameron, could you reflect on your involvement in the Charlottetown Accord? I think we'd all be interested in hearing from you on that. Well, I, I thank you for the question, Richard. I'm not quite sure uh, how much uh, interest there might be, but I, I had the good fortune and the opportunity to serve in the Ontario government as an advisor, first to the Attorney General Ian Scott, the late uh, uh, Ian Scott, uh, who was Attorney General throughout the Meech Lake process, and then ultimately to David Peterson, the, the Premier. And um, I guess uh, my, my main reflection is that uh, when you get up close uh, to a process like that, you see uh, what you might call the messy compromises the 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 ways in which agreements are made uh or not made and that uh these are human beings at the end of the day they are individuals who have beliefs different ideas about things and just as they did in 1864 in charlottetown and just as they did in 1981 when pierre trudeau uh, got nine of the ten provinces to agree to the package for patriation. Uh, what I observed, in particularly in Meech, was that uh, the uh, the art of constitution making is the art of the possible, not the perfect. It's what's possible in a given moment uh, is going to be flawed, and it is going to be the product of these individuals working whoever happens to be around that table and it makes a big difference by the way who was around the table because the different people around the table in 1992 were different there were not only government but there were indigenous organizations and i venture to say in the next round if there is a next round it would be a much broader uh, role for other constituencies and interests in canada so it, it makes a big difference who's sitting around the table and uh and i suspect and this gets back to what we've already been talking about is that the next time this happens if it does not certain it will i think the number of players around the table would be a multiple of what it was in charlottetown we had 17 participants we had the government of the territories and uh governments of the territory then the and national at that time four national indigenous organizations it would include, it would need to necessarily, I think, include a broader range of actors. Jamie, do you have a question? Sure, just uh, so that uh, people know, I'm of a generation. I was very fortunate to be kind of a uh, witness to the patriation reference, the charter coming into uh, existence, the Meech Lake Accord, the Charlottetown Accord, and, and so on. And I was involved briefly in the Meech Lake Accord. I was um, one of the uh, advisors to the Ontario government, and I actually signed the distinct uh, society letter. And then I, I spoke 
at a number of those uh, uh, parliamentary committees in the period between the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord. But I guess the main thing was that I was a member of the National Yes Committee uh, during the uh, referendum process in 1992. And it still kind of amazes me that I was. There were uh, seven co-chairs and 32 members. I certainly was not invited to be on this committee because of my political profile or my political expertise. I think I was probably asked to be on the uh, committee because they needed a couple of individuals who would be able to explain the text of the accord. Well, uh, so that was, um, that was my burden. And uh, the referendum campaign, it turned out to be just a complete open season on the accord. Um, and um, I was put in a position, and, and I approached it as a matter of almost a civic duty. It was um, my responsibility at any number of public sessions to try and explain and uh, defend the accord, the terms of the accord, without being an over-the-top advocate of the yes position. Um, I couldn't make the accord right because the text, quite frankly, was a bit of a punching bag. Um, but um, I, I will say that it was an enormously um, formative experience for me, um, and I was uh, bruised and beleaguered throughout. Um, but I did um, make peace with my role in the um, Charlottetown Accord process and the referendum campaign, and so I, I was grateful to be um, was grateful to, to have that small role to play. Mm -hmm. Thank Maybe you for sharing briefly on that, because, you know, Jamie, uh, I'd forgotten yesterday there were seven co-chairs yes. of the yeah. SPD. And w when you even say that, right, and then the 32 members, if you have seven co-chairs, yeah. uh, you've got a problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was in many ways an emblematic of the whole charlatan process well more has got to be better so one chair is not as good as two co-chairs and seven co-chairs must be better it's not like it was a committee patrick <laughs> <laughs> so we have we have now i have a, i have an onslaught of questions that have come into the, the chat um what i'd like to do is maybe read a few of them and you pick what you'd like to comment on um so let's go let's, let's go a little um quickly so that we can get as many as we can. So first, um, changing a constitutional system in 1982 and then quasi-impossibility, according to Justice Monaghan, to change it thereafter. Is this healthy? First question, let me put another one to you. Um, can you comment on the constitutional amendment in Quebec's Bill 96 in the context of the legacy of Meech and Charlottetown? Let's take those first two, and then we'll come back to some other. Is Bill 96 the, the recognition of Quebec as a nation? Is that what that's referring to? This is, this is the uh, proposal uh, from Quebec last year in 2021. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I mean, well, let me just comment briefly on that. I mean, what, what that illustrates is how things have moved on, I think, from 1987 or even in 1982. 1987 we had a clause that said we're going to interpret the, the Constitution in accordance with two things. One, that Quebec constitutes a distinct society within Canada, and the words within Canada were important. But secondly, that the presence of an English-speaking minority in the province of Quebec and a French-speaking minority outside of the province of Quebec were fundamental characteristics of Canada. And what recent political debates in Quebec and even at the federal level, but the most recent change, which is for, to propose in the constitution of Quebec, that Quebec be recognized as a nation, you have, you have moved, I would say, very significantly further down a road yeah. toward a vision of Quebec as a, as a, as a true nation living within a, a Canadian federal state so there's this umbrella that's provided for by Canada, but there's no sense of these underlying fundamental characteristics of Canada, including the presence of an English speaking minority in Quebec. That's no longer part of, of that recognition. And that just illustrates how this has moved even further down that direction and makes it even more unlikely, therefore, that if we were to return to these issues 
that we could achieve a consensus because I, I think one of the things that did lead to the defeat of Charlottetown outside of the province of Quebec, ironically, because Quebec felt differently, was that some outside of the province of Quebec thought it gave gave too much to the province of Quebec. Conversely, in Quebec, it was thought it didn't recognize the historic demands of Quebec or the historic needs of Quebec. So my comment would be that in a way that illustrates how, yes, things have continued to move. But they haven't moved in a direction, I think, that would that would foster this this broader sense of of uh, of consensus that that, that that would be necessary, I think, for any comprehensive change. Great. Let's hear from you, uh, Jamie, and then I'll put some more questions to you. But you'll each have about thirty seconds each thereafter. Yeah, you have to oh. shut. You'll have to shut me down. Sorry. I would just say very quickly that I mean, I think Bill ninety six is a comment on the consequences of the unfinished business. Uh, going back to 1982 and to the extent um, many of us might have hoped uh, that it would go away and we would be able to find other ways to reconcile with Quebec events have shown that that has not happened in the way we would have liked and you know the question is whether it continues to go in the direction Patrick has outlined you know from Bill 96 and what the next steps are I don't know uh, so, I mean, I think that's just my comment, and I would otherwise say that in answer to the healthy or not question, it's not healthy that we can't uh, change the Constitution, but for the time being, um, we're able to manage, I would say for the time being, we're able to manage the status quo. Thank you. So let me put two more questions out there, 30 seconds each. And to all the attendees, thank you for these questions. They're really fabulous. One challenge, though, is that some of the questions are rather long, and I'm only getting snippets of them. So let's see how we do. Have any particular proposals from Meet Charlottetown aged well, that is to say, become more necessary, or aged poorly, that is to say, would have made things worse, in your view? First question. Second question for you. To what extent are the value differences Patrick refers to, the ones that prevent constitutional amendment? In fact, artificial regional grievances that have been fed by political actors, if that is true, are there ways in which they might be overcome? Two questions, 30 seconds each. I'll just say quickly, in less than 30 seconds, um, Aboriginal self-government in answer to the first, um, and in answer to the second, uh, I don't discount the role and importance of political leadership and the way that political dynamics can change over time. And I will leave it at that, but I also want to thank Richard and the organizers. Oh, no, we're not done. We'll do another round. We'll do another round. Of okay. Yeah. Are my dogs barking something loud? Let me, let me just say that uh, uh, I think many of the proposals in Charlottetown have been put for have been pushed forward significantly but not through formal amendments to the constitution in other words those if we talk look at those issues quebec quebec's recognition as a distinct society indigenous self-government the, the grievances and concerns of the western canada might perhaps not have been have not been recognized to the same extent but but arguably those those issues have been continued to be part of the political agenda and they and they have been reflected in many of the changes as far as this idea that these have been provoked, you know, you know, these differences have been the product of regional grievances that have been stoked. I mean, you know, this goes back to 1867. I mean, we, you know, back in 1867, Canada was a different country and, 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 and uh, regionalism and provincial rights and so on have, have advanced over many, many decades and now for well over 100 years. I make no judgment on it. I think it, it's a reflection of uh, popular views in different parts of the country and there are different views in different parts of the country and uh and those views need to be taken into account because political legitimacy in our country and in democratic societies ultimately depends on the will of the people however imperfect or perfect it may be we may disagree we may agree but that's the only system of government as we have as we say all the other systems of government are worse Right. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's yes, it, it, it may lead to abuse that we don't agree with. But uh, but that's the that's the only system we have. And it's the better system uh, to keep. And I think it's a system we want to we want to stay with. I'm going to put two more questions to you, though, one at a time. 
one from the audience and then one from myself. Question from the audience. Isn't the constitutional minoritarianism described by Alan Cairns in the 1990s, isn't that made even worse today by the mm -hmm. fragmentation of minorities into groups coalescing around even smaller and smaller differences? 30 seconds to each of you, please. Well, uh, I guess I would say that, um, and it's a sort of a comment on what Patrick said and also a response to that question. I mean, the culture of rivalry uh, within our federation, between levels of government, but also between communities uh, within our country is, is something that I think is fluid, but I think it's discouraging and it's discouraging at this point in time. I will leave it at that. Uh, I mean, some would celebrate it as uh, the flowering of many different views and cultures and Canada today is a more open society, a more tolerant society than it was. 30 years ago. I think we are more tolerant today than we were then. We, 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 we recognize things today that we wouldn't have recognized. And think back to 1992, for example, um, equality rights and the recognition of uh, different uh, groups of, uh, you know, the uh, LGBTQ rights, for example. They weren't recognized in 1992 in any significant way today much more so I'm not saying it's everything has been, been done but but it's a, it's a different society it's a more open society i would argue and ultimately a better society in which to live and we prefer to live here than to our neighbors to the south in in large part I think, because of that tolerance and that that openness come rescue me justice monaghan <laughs> uh, uh, I one more I'm trying to get you to come back to Canada. We, we, yes, we need to repatriate you, Richard. Let's see what you can do. You can do. Um, uh, I have one more question that I'd like to put to the two of you. But before I put the question to you, let me just say thank you to all the attendees for being here, to the organizers for the program. I want to give a special thank you, two special thank yous. One to Pat, Patricia Padzi. Um, who is not able to join us today, but she's watching, I think, and I hope, hello, Pat, hope you're well. Second big thank you is to Zara Ahmed, who is the whiz that is making all of the magic work here of the online platform for all of us to gather. Thank you, Zara. Last question. When we gather again in 10 years to mark the 50th anniversary of patriation, do you expect that we'll still be talking about Canada's unamendable constitution. 30 seconds to each of you. I hope so, because that'll mean we're still talking. Um, I don't know about others, but I'm sure counting on you, Richard, to still be talking about the unamendable constitution. And I would just say that I hope to, I hope to God that uh, the, the future of our country doesn't depend uh, solely on the words of a constitutional text. And I, I will take this moment to, to thank uh, the organizers, which I didn't do at the beginning. It's been a great pleasure to be uh, on this uh, panel with uh, Patrick and Richard, both dear friends. Thank you. And thank you both, uh, both Jamie, for your participation and Richard uh, for your participation. And, and, and thanks again. It's been an honor to, uh, to participate in this conference. Thank you very much. And thank you to all. It's been wonderful to have you. Stay tuned for more panels. Go to the website, check out the rest of the panels, and do join in and participate with your questions. Thanks to all so very much once again. Thank you very much. And Jamie and Patrick, just hang on one second before you, you log off. Thanks so much, everyone.